me. Um, I've been up here a few times, but I don't think I've introduced myself. I'm the director of the Congressional App Challenge, um, which is, if you're not familiar, the House of Representatives' official STEM competition for students. Uh, each year, members of Congress inspire thousands of students to pursue a passion and careers in STEM fields. Over seven years, they've reached over 40,000 American students. In 2021, 340 members from all 50 states inspired over 7,500 students to change the world through code. Today, I have the honor of introducing Dr. Nicole Turner Lee, who's with the Brookings Institution. She's a senior fellow in governance studies, director of the Center for Technology and Innovation, the co-editor in chief of Tech Tank, and as I just learned, she has a book coming out later this year on the digital divide. Uh, and she will be introducing and chatting with Alan Davidson. So I'd like to welcome them both to the stage now. People. <laughs> I've seen many of you behind my pixel. <laughs> now I actually get to see you in person. Um, well, I'm excited to be here. As it was mentioned, I'm Dr. Nicole Turner Lee, who I'm at the Brookings Institution, and uh, everybody in here ought to buy my book. It's been long spoken of, and it's almost out. <laughs> and, um, and I'm excited to actually interview my friend. Um, this is no stranger to many of us. I will do due diligence and read a little bit of your bio for people who don't know you. Um, but I don't want to age myself because I know I still look 25 to suggest that I met Alan uh, when he actually started. I know, right? Um, but he had come to start uh, the Google operation, if I remember. This is almost two decades ago, almost like that you were and I probably met and then did a little bit of ask him. But now he has been nominated by President Joe Biden to lead the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. He's not only a technology policy expert for the last 20 years, an executive, a public advocate, a technologist, an attorney, he is recently the new assistant secretary of the Department of Commerce's department. And I think that speaks volumes because, um, not to put you on the spot, but you have a pretty big charge <laughs> um, to actually move forward on the new Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. So we have minimal time that I actually don't want to put towards my commentary, but let's first start by welcoming Alan Davidson to the stage. Thank you, Nicole. And it is a pleasure to be here with you. I know. It's so funny, too, to see him in a suit. He did do technology policy. <laughs> is this what government first does to Yes, I've had to find the ties. <laughs> so, well, I want to start with this first question. I mean, many of us watched your recent hearing where you sort of laid out your grand plan, gave your greatest hits of what you want to do in this new role. Give us some more specifics, right? We're here with its intimate setting, thanks to the state of the net, and Tim. So let's start by hearing, you know, what your greatest hits are and greatest goals are with this new um, investment. Well, first of all, thank, thank you, Nicole. Thank you for that introduction. It is really good to be here with you. Thank you, state of the net. I mean, it is sort of a wonder to see all of your bright and shiny faces, even masked in person. So we're, we're getting there. Um, and I will also say congratulations to State of the Net and to Tim Lord. And I, um, on the 18th State of the Net, I know. Uh, kind of crazy. Yeah, no, really, it's amazing. And I, I was actually at, I think I was at State of the Net number one. And uh, really, I mean, this has for many years now been the place we come to discuss hard issues and think about the future. So it's wonderful to see it still going. And it's wonderful to be here again and uh, in this new role. I will say it is, um, it is an exciting time at NTIA, you know, an, an agency that not that many people necessarily know about, but that now has a kind of mighty mission. Uh, has for a while, but now more than ever. And it does feel like a historic moment. We've been given... Uh, uh, resources to do things that we've never had the chance to do. And I think of it as basically three main priorities. The biggest one is just what you know you were alluding to, folks have been talking about, closing the digital divide. I mean, we have been talking about the digital divide. At this conference, we've been talking about the digital divide for over 20 years. And uh, we finally have the resources to do something really structural about it. Uh, the fact that we've been given in this bipartisan way and a bipartisan infrastructure law well, $65 billion, a big chunk of it to the FCC, but a very big chunk of it to NTIA uh, to really meet the mission of making sure that everybody in America has access to high-speed, affordable internet service, broadband. 
Uh, that is a big goal, and we're going to need a lot of help to do it. I have to talk more about it, but that is really by far the, the big mission right now at NTIA, and people are excited about it. And you can really feel it. It's a different kind of thing. We're also doing work on uh, spectrum policy, which is a huge issue. It's been in the papers recently, a uh, little thing with the uh, altimeters and 5G. Um, so that's going to be a, making sure that we're well coordinated on the federal government side, meeting the twin imperatives of meet, at NTIA. We, we manage federal spectrum. We want to make sure it's being used efficiently and effectively. We also know we need to meet the needs of commercial users out there. Uh, and so that's, that's the twin imperative we work on. And then the final thing is there's, there's a whole lot of other stuff that's on NTIA's plate. We have, we're working on uh, cybersecurity, 5G vendor diversity. We've got work on privacy, uh, civil rights and equity going on right now. We've got some competition work happening. Um, really thinking internationally about how to represent the U.S. and make sure that the world embraces free and open uh, communications networks. Uh, we do work on public safety communications. There's a, there's a giant set of other activities. Uh, so it's an, it is a fun time to be at NTIA. Yeah, I, you know, I had to check my time because we don't have that much time and we want to open it up if we can for questions. Let's stay on the digital divide because I think we could talk about all the other areas, you know, if we had more time. But I want to talk about this digital divide because, you know, it is near and dear to my heart as well. And it's something that I think President Biden and Vice President Harris have also prioritized and placed in the public domain. What is it and how are you going to actually make some progress there, Alan? Like, is it going to involve a full hands-on-deck effort? Is it going to be really looking structurally how the digital divide really aligns with poverty and geographic isolation? Is it just going to be really pushing out infrastructure? It's, it, I think it's all of the above. It has to be all of the above, right? We've been given at NTIA $48 billion right. with a B, so that's a lot. Um, uh, the big chunk of it is actually in state grant programs, $42 billion that goes to states. Really, that's focused on deployment. Right. On the, and that's really the access side of the equation. But we're also thinking about affordability. And the other pieces of it, we've got a digital equity grant program, so, uh, almost $3 billion, almost $3 billion for tribal communities, another billion dollars for middle mile programs. So we're really looking across the whole thing, the whole piece of it. And the thing I'd say is, like, we all know access is not enough, right? We can build a wire to somebody's house, but if they can't afford to get online, if they can afford to get online, but they don't have the devices to do it, none of it works. So we really are focused on adoption through all these programs. And it's not going to just be these programs in the bipartisan law. There's programs at other part departments. And we ourselves have money from other places. Just last week, 300, almost $300 million worth of grants uh, to 13 different states. 133,000 homes that aren't connected will be connected after these grants get deployed. So you will see more of this coming. Are we keeping track of all that stuff? Just we are keeping track. <laughs> I know the chief data off scientist of the U.S. was here earlier, and I saw her in the green room, and yes, we are going to be keeping track of all of it. Um, <laughs> but I will say, this is, you know, we don't really talk about this this much in this forum, State of the Net. You know, we kind of talk about, like, the internet, a lot of the internet policy issues. But I will say, this is a moment Right? This is a moment that we need to all be paying attention to because we haven't been given the chance. This is once in a generation opportunity, so we really need all of your help. Yeah, I mean, I've been talking about it for a long time. I think people are just catching up with me. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about the coordination, though, with the Federal Communications Commission, because now you have a partner with that, and I know Commissioner Starks will come up next, particularly around spectrum coordination, because like you said, we don't often talk about the uh, digital divide at the state of debt, but we do talk about spectrum. So tell us a little bit more about the coordination with the FCC. So first of all, uh, I want to salute Commissioner Starks. He's been an incredible leader on so many of these issues. I know he's coming up. I had a chance to be part of a forum he put together last week. And so uh, thank him for his work and congratulate the FCC on their work on affordability. It's been incredible. On spectrum, uh, you know, what we've seen in the, in the newspapers is that the way we've been doing spectrum policy in the U.S needs to be improved, yeah. right? Uh, this is not a tenable outcome where people bid for spectrum, get it, then we have problems with using it, and federal agencies maybe can't meet their mission. So a key piece of it is going to be about coordination among the federal users, and it starts between NTIA and FCC. My second day on the job, had a great conversation with Chairwoman Rosenworcel. We have been in near constant communication since then, which is great. That's what we need. We just launched a program, uh, the Spectrum Coordination Initiative, two weeks ago uh, that's going to involve real measurable 
coordination between our organizations, a new memorandum of understanding, work on a national spectrum strategy, so uh, getting our engineers to talk together more. So there's a lot of different pieces, and that's where it all starts. It's not glamorous all the time, honestly, you know. I mean, it's, you know, it's hard work to do spectrum coordination, but we are going to do it. We're going to be meeting this, uh, I guess, as I say, this month, March, be our first meeting, and then we'll be meeting monthly uh, for the foreseeable future to get, get, our, get the trains running. Yeah, I mean, I think the coordination is going to matter in this, right, because you both have different parts of the problem to solve. So I think, you know, sharing where you're going with that. And again, I'm going to try because a lot of you know that I can't talk. So I'm going to actually give you some time so you can ask some questions. I just have one last question. And I think that this is one that doesn't often come up with NTIA, which is global commerce and competitiveness, right? I think a couple years ago, NTIA looked at the digital economy more broadly in terms of United States competition. Just, you know, this is a moment. There's a lot going on in Ukraine in particular, but I'm just curious as we think about supply chain issues and technology, you know, where that fits in your docket? Well, it's, um, it's, it's actually quite important for us to be thinking about uh, this broad range of competitiveness for the U.S. You know, in some ways, these other issues we're talking about are about competitiveness, yes. right, and uh, how we work in the globe. Um, for NTI, I mean, this kind of feeds into a lot of what we do, but we do have a couple of particular programs in, uh, when you think about global competitiveness in the U.S. One is around 5G, for example, um, you know, really thinking about how to have a more competitive environment for 5G equipment, uh, greater vendor diversity, which can help us with security as well. We know there have been real issues with 5G security because, stemming from that. So we've got a program to promote a much more open and innovative 5G ecosystem with new competitors uh, based on op open radio access networks, open RAN. Um, that's going to be a huge priority for us. I think we're also trying to be, in other areas, very strategic. And this is across the US government. You probably heard about some of this earlier today at the conference, too, about how we engage with international standards bodies and really think, uh, and international fora generally, how can we represent this US vision of private sector-driven innovation, of open and free communications networks, that is a major priority for us. We're doing a lot of work at the ITU, for example. Folks have been talking about this election this year for the Secretary General of the ITU. When you, you know, we, there's a, an American woman, the first woman uh, who would ever be Secretary General. There's also a, I mean, you couldn't make this up, a, Rush, a former Huawei executive who's Russian. Um, <laughs> Anyway, we, I think that we feel the choice is clear, um, but the, uh, that is going to be a major priority, not to make light of it. I think it is actually really quite important for us to be engaging in these fora very strategically. Yeah, and I would say that I think you're at a prime moment to make that work as well, right? Because the supply chain has definitely showed itself uh, as one of the key components of our competitiveness going forward. One of the things I'd also just say, and if you have a question, just start thinking about it now, because I may have time for one or two. But I would just say this, the digital divide is also closing that is part of our competitiveness, because the less likely we have, you know, Absolutely. I mean, it's about how do you make our economy That's more right. resilient? How do you make sure that people all over the country can participate and thrive That's in right. the modern economy? It's not, it's urban, it's rural, it's including the people over there. It's about solving some of the deep inequities that we've had, right. addressing some of the deep inequities that we've had in our society. But it's also about making us our, ourselves stronger when we address those things. And so uh, we think of this all as part of a part and parcel. Mm -hmm. And I totally agree with you. Bridging the digital divide is a huge part of making our society more resilient and more competitive. Yeah. Okay. I got, okay, I got one right here. So let's just do one quick question. Tim, I guess I got one or two. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy Pesner, Carnegie Mellon University. Earlier today, we had a panel on broadband. And one question that I wanted to ask but didn't get the chance, so I'll take it now, was asking, uh, how do we even talk about broadband? As we know, the FCC definition is still 25.3. Um, Joseph Wender from the Treasury quoted 120. Uh, so how are we even going to know that we're talking about broadband if there is widespread consensus that what we know is broadband might be sufficient? And even then, is speed the answer? Uh, do we need to be start talking about whether key, what I would call anchor applications, Zoom being an obvious example, um, are going to be reliably accessible and workable for everyone? throughout the U.S.? It's a terrific question, and fortunately for me, and a complicated question, but I would say fortunately for us at the NTIA, 
We have an answer because Congress has given us an answer, a very clear answer, and it's the statute. We are going to be focusing, especially in our big state grant program, first on what the law calls the unserved, people who do not have 25 megabits per second uh, and uh, downstream 3 megabits per second upstream. And we're going to be making sure that they are provided with at least 120 service, and there's a latency requirement in there, too. So we are going to actually, you know, that has been prescribed, and we're going to be making sure that when we put this program out, we're very clear about those requirements. We are going to be looking to the future, too, and making sure, and we hope that states will look to the future as well to make sure that we're not coming back here five or ten years from now uh, and saying we didn't do the job. Right. So uh, I think that will be a piece of this. But like I say, the law for us is quite clear in terms of what the requirements of this program are going to be. Yeah. Well, and I'm glad you're thinking about it because um, I'll just write it in a blog when I think about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tim, do I have time for one more question? All right. <laughs> okay. I know. Thank you so much. Uh, Christina Pishuk with the American Consumer Institute. So we have seen various uh, types of broadband deployments, you know, from wire to wireless and satellites um, that have been used to successfully deliver broadband to a population like living in regions with different types of infrastructure and different topographies, different population densities. So I'm wondering what are your thoughts on a um, mixed technology approach to um, deliver those services to unserved areas versus to just rather relying on a fiber approach? Well, again, here we're very lucky because this are the, the law we're implementing is pretty clear about it. We're technology neutral, or we need to be, uh, and we're taking an all of the above approach. That said, we are, you know, we're, this law is also quite clear about the standards. I mentioned, you know, 120 megabits per second, 100 millisecond latency, um, technologies that are deployed are going to need to meet those things. And we expect that states are going, as they implement these programs, are going to be thinking about the future too and wanting to make sure that technologies are resilient. We know that, for example, some technologies like fiber have, uh, you know, kind of a future proofing, an ability to be used and to a resilience to the future that I think is going to be attractive. We also are we know that there's a very long tail of difficult places to get to where that may not be the best answer. And so I think we expect that there'll be a diversity of approaches and different states will take different approaches too. But the law is pretty clear about how we implement it. All right, one more question. Uh-huh. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, come on, you're making me so hard. I know. Uh, Rick, we'll go with you. <laughs> Alan, congratulations on your confirmation. Uh, you're, you're an amazing pick. Um, as you know, I recently testified on the who is issue in front of Congress as a national cybersecurity issue. For the past four years, NTIA has been telling us that we should wait for the ICANN process. But just recently, the CEO of ICANN said the dark who is GDPR problem cannot be fixed by ICANN. Um, as you know, we believe that there should be legislation in Congress to fix this because it is a national cybersecurity issue. What is NTIA's position at this point? Well, we are believers, as the U.S. government has been for some time, in the importance of the multi-stakeholder system. And uh, I think it's very important that we, that we continue to support that. Uh, I strongly also believe and said that, uh, you know, we need to find a way to meet the legitimate needs of who is use the, the, the community that, uh, of enforcers, law enforcement, other legitimate enforcers who need access to who is data and, and protecting the privacy of, of, of individuals on the who is database too. And we believe there are ways to do that. Uh, my hope is that I can, will find a way to do it. Uh, and I will say, you know, I've even, I've, I've had a chance to speak uh, with the ICANN leadership about this and we will be uh, pressing uh, to make that happen. I totally hear you. Uh, but, you know, the, the best way to do it by far would be to do it through the multi-stakeholder process rather than having many, many different, you know, statutes all over the world. But we do know we need to meet this need and we'll be paying close attention to it. Um, Tim said I had one more question and I think the gentleman over here had a question. So we'll go to you. Uh, I, I was trying to catch your attention, you know, exercise, Tim, exercise. 
Yeah, I just had a quick one about, um, you know, broadband deployment. The FCC itself said their maps aren't good enough um, when it comes to where is broadband deployed. It's a lot of money. I was just curious why this time is going to be different and what NCIA is going to do to, you know, make sure that people are actually being served properly because, you know, the FCC themselves said the maps aren't adequate. It's a great question, and the maps are essential. The maps have been bad. I think we all know that, and um, and until we, it, we 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 can't do this properly without better mapping data. I think what's different this time is that there is both a clear process and real resources behind making those maps better. So the FCC has been we've been directed. The FCC will be redoing the maps. They're in the process of. Uh, of, of putting together what will be a much more detailed fabric about locations and where people are served and unserved. There's going to be much more granular data than there's ever been before. Um, and I will say, you know, the um, uh, communities will have a chance to challenge this, right? There's a process built in where people will take a look at it uh, and have a chance to really kick the tires on this data. So we're, we've got a much better process than we've ever had before in the federal government. We at NTIA will be relying on the NTIA's maps, but we're coordinating with them closely on that. And um, I'll just say I think I think they're going to be much better than what we've had before. Uh, we need to. I think it will be a continuous process of making sure we ever will, will they'll be ever improving. Uh, but I think what we'll what we'll be relying on, and and it, there's real money at stake. So that also is what's different, <laughs> right? When you have billions of dollars at stake, you can be sure people will be paying attention in ways they haven't before. So uh, that's a little bit of a reason for optimism, but it's gonna be a lot of work and we know that, and uh, it's a great question to be, to be, to be raising. Yeah. Well, I, I have the privilege of uh, wrapping up unless you have anything else you wanna say. Thank you, Nicole. I will say that. I know I will I'm sitting say, on my hands over here. I do know I have something to say. You, I'll bet you do. I will just say, and then I'll turn it over to you. I will just say, um, this is a it does it is a historic moment for us at NTIA in a way that we haven't had before. As somebody who's been part of this community, I would just say, we need your help. Uh, this is an all hands on deck kind of moment. We. This is like rural electrification or building the interstate highway system, a moment that we don't see very often. And we have a chance in these, with these resources uh, to really make a structural difference in people's lives and give them access to something that they need to thrive in the modern economy. But it's going to take a lot of work. It's not going to just be us. It's going to be state broadband offices. It's going to be communities figuring out how to deliver this. It's going to be individual providers stepping up. It's going to be nonprofits being engaged in this. And so I would just say we need all of your attention and help uh, to make this happen in the next few years. And it's a huge opportunity for us if we can get it right. So thank you for your attention. I'm delighted to be here talking to you about it. No, and I, I just want to just tag on to what Alan had said, because you know I can't leave without just saying this. We've just come out of a two-year experiment which showed that being connected to the Internet really mattered. And we now have the opportunity to carve out a structural solution that ensures that all of those young people that couldn't get access can actually learn and all the people who couldn't work could actually have that choice to work remotely. And so we've got a big task before us. And I just say to you, we'll put our seatbelt on if you <laughs> promise to drive it <laughs> where we all don't crash because being in this space like you for 30 years, it's time to really do something about it because we have no other choice. And so with that, let's say thank you to Alan Davidson, our thank new you. Assistant Secretary of NTIA. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, everyone. Send him your virtual hugs when you know that he's uh, <laughs> in the news. And thank you so much, Tim, for hosting this conversation.